Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another chapter of Experiencer Interviews. And today we've got another lovely soul coming to us from the U.S. We have Christy Patterson on board today. Christy has been a contactee with alien life forms since the age of five. She is an internationally known full-time psychic medium from Omaha, Nebraska, and the author of We Are Not Alone, an Extraterrestrial Contact. Published in 2019, Christy is a nationally known public speaker on the topics of UFOs, spirituality, and the paranormal. Christy also is the subject of a documentary titled We Are Not Alone, which premiered in January 2023. The documentary is based on her book, We Are Not Alone, My Extraterrestrial Contact, where she details her life as an ET experiencer. And it, Christy brings her heart, humor, and grace to, to her profound experience based on lifelong, lifelong contact with extraterrestrials, including physical exams, technology, and meeting her own hybrid children. So Christy, thank you so much for coming on. It is my pleasure. Thank you for having me on. Um, so like so many of us, you've had this sort of double life starting from a very uh, young age. And now you've had this sort of secret that you kept to yourself. So so what was it? Yes. And I always say everybody's got secrets. And the reason they're secrets is because they are embarrassed about some of the things they've done or they're afraid of being judged or ridiculed. And for me, it was actually both because I've got quite the past. But the secret I had, one secret was that I was a psychic medium and people were not ready to accept that in me. But the biggest secret was that I have had contact with extraterrestrials since the age of five. Wow. So how did they show up to you? How did they present themselves to you? The first time at the age of five, I had, I call it a near-death experience, but it wasn't where I died and, and went to heaven, met God and got sent back, but I was very, very sick. And my whole family had had the flu and recovered within 24 hours. And five days later, I was still so sick at the age of five. And finally, my mom called the doctor and she said, get her to the hospital immediately. I'll meet you there. So they brought me to the hospital and they took the hospital bed and kind of rigged it up with it was ice underneath and then a blanket over the top and put that on me or put me on top of it so to take my temperature down and i remember there was a nurse that was assigned directly to me and feeding me this orange soda to help lower my temperature as well and at one point in the middle of the night i remember being paralyzed and i could not move anything except my eyes and so I would look around the room and the nurse was paralyzed as well at the foot or the top of my bed and she would not move. And I thought, this is so bizarre. And this doctor came in and it didn't look like any doctor I'd ever seen before. And he had this white lab coat on, a stethoscope out of his pocket, and it was so bright, it obscured his face. And I thought, there's no light, there's no ambient noise, there's nothing. What is the stethoscope reflecting off? And he came up to me and telepathically started talking to me and said, I would always be safe and always be protected. And I thought, well, of course, I'm five years old and I come from a loving family. Of course, I'm safe and protected. Well, years later under hypnosis, it was a gray that had come into that room looking like a doctor. And there were two others on the other side of the bed too, which I have no memory of until hypnosis came. And so with the way I interpret that is that I had a job to do on this planet and I would be always safe and protected by them. Otherwise I couldn't do what I came to this planet to do. So that was my first contact. So did you figure out what was the the stethoscope? Was it like a form of technology they were using? No, I think they just didn't want me to see his face oh. because it was so bright. It obscured his face. Oh, I see. I see. That's, yeah. they're smart. They're so smart. <laughs> they are smart. <laughs> and when he left, then I could move again. The nurse started moving again and started feeding me some more of that horrible orange soda. <laughs> and then I found out years later when I was in my 40s, that my mom said that when they came the next day to pick me up, the doctor said, we almost lost her last night. And I had no idea that I was that close to death. 
until, yeah, 35, 40 years later, my mom told me. So that's why I call it a near-death experience, because I really was close to death. I just didn't have the, the paranormal experience. I had the extraterrestrial experience. So what happened after that? Did they show themselves to you uh, in another fashion? Did they come to you at your house? It, what's really interesting is that I have no memory of contact until then the age of 30, but I was a very odd child. And I know now through hypnosis that I was constantly being taken and constantly being subjected to experiments and examinations and all of this because weird things would set me off. Um, when I was babysitting as a young girl, I'd come home through our backyard and I'd just lay in the grass and just say, take me home. I want to go home. I want to go home and loved the stars and the planets and the moons. And that's where I belonged rather than, you know, the 10 steps to my, the backyard of my house. And then I get in trouble the next day for you're supposed to get home. <laughs> you know, Don't lay in the grass at two o'clock in the morning when I'm 12 years old. And, yeah. And different things. One time, in the 70s, I believe it was, my grandfather, my grandfather, my father had to go on a business trip. So the whole family was going out to the airport to wish him well on his trip. And it was right when they were putting metal detectors in the airports, because there were hijackings and, and things like that. And I saw that metal detector and panicked. I could not go through it. And I mean, it was just an archway and you walk through, you could see what was on the other side. But I knew something horrible was going to happen to me if I walked through that. And my mother is yelling at me. She's just telling me what a brat I am and spoiled rotten. And then finally she said, how about if I hold your hand? No, no, I can't. I can't. I was so petrified and defiant. Well, again, years later under hypnosis, they would send me through archways very much like the metal detectors to go into examination rooms. And I just, so it was flashbacks, downloads like that throughout my childhood, where I know now I was being taken, although I don't have direct memory until the age of 30. And I want to hear about the age of 30. <laughs> Yes. Well, uh, let me back up just a little bit. I had so many physical things happening to me through childhood too. Major, major nosebleeds. And where they, my mom would have to put me on a sofa with bath towels around my neck and ice packs on my nose. And this was all the time. And nobody else in my family had that. Motion sickness. Every time I'd get into a car, I'd get sick. In classrooms, if there were too many people, I'd faint. And it was just constant, constant things going on with me. And even to the point when I was probably 24, I believe, I had moved to California by then from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, my hometown. And I had a minor outpatient surgery. Then they tested or typed my blood. And I was a type B positive. All right, no big deal. I moved to Omaha and I decided to be a blood donor. And I was, oh, I'm getting my time frames a little mixed up, but I twice my blood type has changed. The second time they typed it and I was a type A. I said, can your blood type change? No, of course it can't. And they made me feel stupid. And then I decided to be the blood donor. And do you know your blood type? Um, I think I'm A. And they typed it anyway. No, you're B. So I went from B to A to B. And this is on medical records because this was with an outpatient surgery. It was donating blood, another minor surgery. And so it's weird things like that without me having any front knowledge of being taken. But all of these really weird, bizarre things were happening to me. And then at the age of 30, I always knew I never wanted to have children. And my older sister, she goes, well, you know, don't do anything till the age of 30, because that's when your maternal instinct kicks in. And I, I'm looking at my watch going, when? TikTok. <laughs> and so from my birthday present to myself at age 30, I had a tubal ligation. I had my tubes tied. And a couple weeks after that, I was lying on my bed on a Sunday afternoon, reading a book, wide awake, and three beings popped into my room. And it was a female and two males looking very Egyptian to me. 
Um, the woman had dark, dark brown hair with bangs, um, hair you know, down to about the shoulders. Both of the men had receding hairlines, the younger man not receding as much as the older man. And they paralyzed me. And it just, I was so flabbergasted with who are these people? And they, they looked human, but they looked Egyptian human to me. And again, I could only see them from the chest area up. And they were talking to me telepathically and they were angry with me. But why are they angry? Well, what they were telling me is that I had my tubes tied and they were angry because they didn't think they would have access to my eggs anymore. And they flipped me over on my bed, lifted me up from behind and did an examination. And when they realized that they still had access to my eggs, they just weren't going down the fallopian tube anymore. They were fine and they were gone as quickly as they came. And I wake up then able to move on all fours on my bed. And it's like, what just happened? And I, I was not into UFOs. Uh, wasn't I didn't study ufology, none of that. So this was so completely foreign to me. And several weeks later, I decided to tell a friend. We went for a walk together. And I told her, and I still wasn't public as a psychic medium yet, so she didn't know that I could kind of read what was going on in her mind. And her thoughts were, wow, this is really cool. Ooh, I wonder if she's crazy. Can we still be friends anymore? Who else can I tell? You know, and this whole myriad of thoughts going through her head. And other than that, she really didn't say anything. And that was my sign to shut up and don't say anything. Keep the secret. I did try to tell one other friend and got a similar reaction. However, she did introduce me to a co-worker of hers that believed in UFOs. And we, I was able to talk to him. He, he had no experience, but I was able to talk to him about it a little bit anyway. I kept doing research, and I found Dr. Jack Kasher, who was the head physicist at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. And he also was the head field investigator for MUFON, which is the Mutual UFO Network, the international organization. And I called him up shaking and asked if I could have an appointment with him. And he said, yes. And the whole time I'm walking on the campus to his office, I didn't know which was worse, whether he believed me or he didn't believe me. If he believed me, that meant this was true. If he didn't believe me, it meant I was crazy. And which was worse? You know, I, I didn't know. And I sat down and I told him my story. And at that time, it was only the, the, the visitation where they did the examination. And I have real-time memory of it. He sat so quietly and listened to everything. His first comment was, I don't think this was the only time. And I just, my jaw dropped. But I couldn't even wrap my head around that going, Oh, well, all right, whatever. But he believed me. And that meant more to me than anything. And he also said there was a support group in Omaha. A support group in Omaha, Nebraska? How many people have had this experience? And I went to the support group and I said, I found my tribe. They are all telling me similar but different stories of their contact, enough to validate that mine were real and to hear their stories as well. And it was just life-saving for me to be connected with that group. Well, another month or two passed, and I find out there's a UFO symposium in Lincoln, Nebraska, which is 45 minutes away. And so coming from no knowledge of UFOs to having contact in a, now a support group and now a symposium, it's like obviously things were really opening up for me. And at that symposium, I got to meet Linda Moulton Howe, which most people know who she is. Uh, she's a journalist investigator and really specializes in on cattle mutilations. But she was speaking and I got to ask a question. And her first response was, I don't think this is the only time this is to you. So verbatim, she said what Dr. Kasher had told me as well. And I got to meet Stanley Friedman. Um, 
Friedman, yeah, he's now passed, and a few other dignitaries in the UFO field. Friedman, excuse me. And it just, it put me at ease, but it also scared the living bejesus out of me. But what happened is by me going to that symposium, going to Dr. Kasher, it was almost like sending a permission slip because now the downloads started happening. And for people who don't know what a download is, is like someone handing you a book and you have all the information at your fingertips, but how do you make sense of it? It's like you have to go through first page, second page, third page. So these downloads would be boom in my head. All the information is there, but not being able to make sense of it all. I mean, it just was crazy. And with nobody to talk to and nobody to go to um, other than that support group, which meant every month, but they weren't familiar with what I was experiencing as far as the downloads went. You know, and there would be times where it felt like I hadn't been contacted in weeks, several months. And I remember one morning I was taking a walk and just feeling upbeat and happy. It was a beautiful day walking. And I thought, wow, I have not been contacted in a while. The minute that thought was in my head, I got a download that was so huge. And it was not only have I been contacted and abducted on a regular basis, but it had happened the night before. And it brought me to my knees with, yes, this is ongoing, it's been happening, but that they can control what I remember and what I don't remember. And, you know, to be that vulnerable and have that loss of control, I mean, it's, it did, it brought me to my knees and I crawled over to a bench on this walking path and just sat and cried because I felt so out of control and didn't understand why this was happening yet. And to try to make sense of it was just insane. But, you know, there were days I'd feel pregnant and then I wouldn't feel pregnant. And this went on, you know, throughout all of my 20s, my 30s, as they were doing all of this to me. And probably the most profound experience for me was, well, I'll back up just a little bit because I used to get so angry because you know, there have been surveys done with people who have been abducted and they say, no, uh -uh, it's not scary. It's not frightening. And I want to call bull on that. Once I was abducted and on a craft, it wasn't scary. Not at all. It felt like it was a place I needed to be. I was participating in these examinations. What was terrifying, and it would be terrifying for anybody, is if what if you woke up in the middle of the night and there are people in, in your bedroom? It's terrifying. And I always knew when they were going to come because there would be a shift of energy in the room. And it would be like, and boom, I'd be gone and on a craft. But that's what was scary. That's what was terrifying. And one night I got so angry. I shook my fist in the air and I said, were you people born in a barn? Don't you know how to knock? And about two weeks later in my head, I hear boom and I'm gone on a craft. So you know, there, I always tell, because I mentor a lot of people who've had experiences now, and so they always look for loopholes. So you've got to be very careful in what you say, the boundaries that you set, your parameters, because they will find loopholes every time. And yeah, now I hear knocking on the side of my bedroom, outside of my house. And I hear, I'm like, but now I'm used to it. So it's like, oh my God, whatever, instead of being terrified because they're not showing up in my bedroom. Well, one night they did show up in my bedroom and this is not a download memory. This is a real, real time memory. And they said they needed me on a craft to save my daughter. Well, if you remember, I never wanted to have children. And so it, I was confused with my daughter and yet it didn't feel all that unfamiliar to me. So I agreed and they took me on a craft, put me in this relatively small room. I say it's about the size of an average bathroom in a house. Very sterile looking. Everything was white and what looked like stainless steel, but I knew it wasn't stainless steel, but it felt that way. And they put me on this bench and they brought in this little girl. And I could hold her in both of my hands both the palms of my hands. She was so tiny, so delicate. And yet her energy, it felt like she might've been the age of two. 
but I don't know for sure, but she was so teeny tiny and such a baby, this gray pallor to her skin, which was not the color of the gray ETs. It was the color of gray of death. And she had these big, huge black eyes and they put her in my hands. And you have to forgive me because this is still decades later, really painful to talk about. And is said every maternal instinct that I didn't think I had kicked into gear. And I just held her and I, I talked to her. I kissed her. I loved her. All the things that a mother needs to do to a baby. And I started to see color come back into her face and these beautiful peaches and cream complexion. And I just thought, how can I let her go? This is my child. Then, and I have no idea of time. I'm guessing about four hours this took, but it could have been minutes, days, weeks. I have no concept of time. But after the color came back into her face, her skin, and I did what a mother needs to do, the grays came back in the room and there were several of them. And they went to take her from me. And I thought, how can I do this? How I can't let her go. And these emotionless beings. And then I thought, you know, they might not have emotion to her, but she certainly has emotion towards them. It's the only family she knows. And I thought, I have to, I have to let her go. And she, I put her down. She kind of scampered over to the grays and I had to reconcile. And this is the heart that um that I saved her I did my job as a mother and I saved my child and I had to let her go in most painful thing I've ever been through in my life because I didn't know what was going to happen to her you know and to my knowledge I've never seen her again but evidently I'd made a deal that night with the grays and I said that I would do this for my daughter if they would show me my other children. On some level, I knew that there were other children. So they took me down a hallway. There were two doors that opened up and it was a small gymnasium type of a room. And there were about 35 children in there. They looked very alien to me. They were very spindly, almost like they didn't have spines but they were erect. They were standing up. They all had very large heads, very dark black eyes, and very scraggly, spindly black hair. And they looked a little bit more Asian than the Egyptian that I was used to seeing. And so I opened these doors and I had no connection to them whatsoever, none. And they looked at me, I would say like a benign intruder. And I closed the doors. It's like, I'm done. I had no connection to them whatsoever. And then I woke up in my bed. Can I ask you a question? Um, now, Absolutely. do you know, do you, do you think the reason why that you've never wanted children, was it like subconsciously you knew that you probably had star children above? Uh, yeah, I believe that's absolutely correct. That my job was not to have human children. My job was to, that I was, constantly having hybrid children. And with my daughter, they told me that she had too much human in her and she was experiencing failure to thrive. And that's why with the other approximately 35 that I saw, they looked very alien to me. So it would have been a different balance where my daughter had too much human and she would have been the youngest too. So I think there was more experimenting with creating hybrids. And that's why she looked more human to me because she would have fit into our society other than great big dark eyes, but she looked human, um, human enough that I think she could have blended into our society where all of these other children, no way, no, they wouldn't have fit in at all. Coming back to your hybrid children, those that were spindly, um, now how did they feel, their, you know, their energy? Um, did they see you as a, like an intruder? Did uh... They did, but it was a benign intruder. It's like, why is she interrupting our game? Because if they were playing some kind of a game. And they just looked like, why, why is she? Who is she? Why is she here? Why is she interrupting our game? 
kind of a thing. So they had no connection to me. I had no connection to them. So I guess they didn't, uh, the grades didn't say that you were coming beforehand. Evidently. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, coming back to the uh, your episode where the three uh, Egyptians came to you, did they appear through a portal? No, they just showed up. And you know, it could have been a portal that I didn't see because I was lying on my bed reading a book and they showed up right behind me, first of all, before they turned and came to my side. So it could have been a portal. I don't know. I didn't see it. I never remember going on a craft. I just remember being on a craft. And the craft, the huge circular craft, and there were hundreds of beds gurneys that kind of mimicked the inside shape of that craft and it was almost like we were on a conveyor belt of sorts and it would be bed after bed and there would be a whole line of doctors nurses examination people waiting at the end and so when it became my turn the person before the doctor would put my legs in stirrups undrape a sheet sheet from me and then the doctor would use tools very much like a gynecologist would use today and then there were others that had would do electric stimulus let's say on other parts of my female anatomy and they would do this exam they would take tissue and then and it happened fast 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 and then they would cover me up with the sheet again and the next person would be in line for their examination but on the on the gurney on the way back to the room where I would have put my clothes back on and go back home, I remember passing walls filled with shelves of glass jars with body parts, fetuses, all kinds you know, in various stages of growth or death, and these big, huge jars uh, filled with liquid. And these body parts, fetuses would be floating in there. And I remember looking at it and if I was not in that almost catatonic state that they put you in, because it was, again, paralysis, except for my eyes move, being able to move. If I saw that as a human being that I am today, I would be so horrified. But I remember being very neutral about it as they would wheel past these walls and just go, wow, that's interesting. Hmm, fascinating. And nobody would react that way in human form today at all yeah and then boom i would wake up back in my bed and sometimes there would be blood on my sheets on my pillow i might wake up with my head at the foot of the bed just you know in all kinds of different positions did you ever have an mri to see if they inserted implants into your nose i have never had that but i do know that i've got implants it, that came out under hypnosis that in my nasal passages, which were all the bloody noses as a child, the back of my head, there is, an, I think there still is an implant there today. And then um, on my left wrist. So I know that I've had as many as three at any given time. So you saw like human type ETs ish, a grays. Did you ever see other types of beings? Yes. I've been contacted by two different groups. And one I call the grays, the other group I call the technological group. And yeah, they started decades after the grays started visiting me. This was when I would, I think I want to say I was probably close to 40 when this technological group started contacting me. And again, there I go on a craft again. But was so interesting with the grays, I was terrified. With this technological group, I was not. And one live memory I have is being on a craft and there would have been tiered seating behind like what we would call a cockpit. And I was way towards the back with this tiered seating and there were big, long like, conference tables there. And I'm sitting there and a teacher was off to my left side and he said, OK, Christy, come on over. It's time for programming. And I'm acting, well, I call it like a petulant child, going, no, you know, I don't like technology. You know, I'm not any good at this. And he's like, get over here. I'm like, oh. And so I begrudgingly got up and walked over to this wall. It was a bank of computers, I guess, for lack of a better word. And I started pushing buttons, dialing, and programming things. And even then, it's like, how do I know how to do this? I was shocked. 
that I knew how to do this. And it was just practice, 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 practice with my teacher guiding me. And then he took me down a little bit to another wall where there were holographic images. And there were there was a big, huge fire and people running and screaming. And he said, these are the people you're going to save. And I didn't know what he was talking about. But my first question was, what about my family? He said, no, they will be taken care of by somebody else. These are your people that you're going to take care of. I said, I have never rescued anyone. I've never been in a fire. I've never been in that kind of a natural disaster. And he said, you'll know what to do when the time is right. And, you know, I, what do you do? You, you trust it, believe it? I'm not sure. But I said, oh, okay. And then I woke up in my bed again. Then this group, the technological group, has started, they started teaching me how to fly crafts. And I almost didn't even put that in my book because I thought, who is going to believe that? And I thought, put everything in that book or don't write it. And after I published it, I've had so many people contact me saying that they have been taught how to fly crafts as well. And it started with, I call it like a Volkswagen Beetle bug sized car, you know, something teeny tiny on a very grassy flat plane and learning how to take off, which evidently is the hardest part because there's no ignition there's no combustible engine, you know, like cars are. It's a connection that you make with your mind and the craft. You become one. And I remember uh, uh, struggling with that thinking, you know, trying to power through. And evidently I did okay. But I remember the first time just kind of grazing the top of this grassy land. But I was so excited that I learned how to, to start this thing and fly. Well, evidently, you know, I must have learned and gotten promoted. I don't know. <laughs> and the crafts kept getting larger. And then I'd go around hills and then mountain ranges to go through. And finally, the last memory I have of learning is the um, cityscape of New York. And I had a job one time where I spent a week uh, in New York every month for four years. And so I know the cityscape very, very well. And it was to learn how to go through buildings, not through them, around them, around buildings without, you know, taking out a building, taking out people. <laughs> and I remember being just very agile with that. And so evidently, and I have, again, no idea if this was months or years of learning how to fly crafts, but evidently right now I am part of what I like to call a first responder group. And my... The ETs just laugh when I use that term because they said, no, that's not it at all. But there is no term in, you know, in English to describe what it is. But I am with a group of people. I fly the craft and we go to planets that are in trouble, are being destroyed. And my job or our job as a team is to go either evacuate life forms from this planet or to save and rebuild on this planet. My individual job is to help underwater life. And so I go underwater and I cannot tell you how many dreams I've had growing up being underwater and working with the life forms in the oceans. A joke I used to make at parties, you know, people would say, oh, do you believe in UFOs? And I'd say, yes, I do. Well, have you ever seen one? And my response was always not from the outside. <laughs> and I was always waiting for people to go, what do you mean not from the outside? And that was my cue that they might be ready to hear my story. Nobody has ever said that. They would just go, oh, okay, and move on to the next topic. So nobody was ready or was paying attention. I think it was just a party type of question. So and under hypnosis, yes, they tell me I've seen many, many crafts from the outside. But conscious memory, no, I have no memory of, of an outside of a craft. They just feel very disc-shaped to me. Um, a lot of uh, well, experiences, the, the, they also have this sort of uh, like paranormal type of aspect to their experiences. Did you see ghosts or interact with ghosts? Uh, I never did that during an abduction, but my whole life I've connected to ghosts, you know, and I am a psychic medium. 
So I, that's my job. I talk to dead people <laughs> all day long <laughs> and I interact you know, with my spirit guides. I work with people to meet their spirit guides. So I spend more time on the other side than I do on planet earth. Did you ever have uh, the feeling that you knew that maybe like a close someone, like a relative might be on the way to leaving this uh, earthly uh, orbit, let's say, that he was about to die. Did you ever get that feeling? I used to all the time. I knew when people were going to die, whether they were connected to me or not. And I had to, there was one time in, for instance, and it happened to be um, a very dear friend of mine. Her parents were visiting from another state and they happened to have a Southern accent. And they said, Christy, when are you gonna come back to North Carolina? (laughs) <laughs> and I had to bite my tongue till it bled to keep from saying for your funeral. And 10 days later, she died. And so I, I knew this. And finally, I talked to my guides and I said, I don't want to know this. It serves no purpose whatsoever to know when people are going to die. And I said, I don't even want negative information unless there's something positive I can do about it. And they really have stuck to that for me. Just last week, I was man, doing a reading for a lady. And her mom came through and she's, what I heard was this too will pass. So I'm talking, doing a reading for this lady. I said, your mom just came through and said, this too will pass. And we started talking a little bit more. We'll come to find out this lady had, she's dealing with a type of cancer. And I don't want to say specifically what kind, but she goes, oh, and my brother died of the same thing. I went, oh, okay. And we finished the reading. Well, after she left, I went, oh my gosh, I misinterpreted that. Her mother said that she too will pass. So even though my guides no longer tell me that, evidently <laughs> deceased loved ones are still going to tell me. So yeah, she said she too will pass. And I'm so grateful I didn't say that. And I misinterpreted it and said, this too will pass. It's, you know, sometimes it's a load to carry. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Coming back to that second group that you're involved with, uh, were they also greys? What what, what were they? What did they look like? They, uh, I only remember my teacher and he looks like right out of Star Trek. And I asked him, I said, what do you really look like? And he goes, I can't show you what I really look like because it would be so frightening to you that I can't show you. So it's just because he knew I loved Star Trek. I'm the, you know, the oldies from the sixties, that one, I never watched next generation, but it would have been a character right out of Star Trek. You know, it's like a part right in the middle of the head and there's a wrinkly, wrinkly skin coming out. And he's always in these robes and she, she, you want to go off the deep end here today <laughs> because, um, gosh, maybe two, two and a half years ago, I was doing some automatic writing because I was going to teach a class. And I thought, well, I need to practice. So I put pen to paper and my hand started moving. It said, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Ramadir. I hail from the planet Eurites, which is part of the Andromedan star system. And I said, are you a, my, one of my spirit guides? And he goes, no, I'm a guide of your planet. And I didn't know our planet had spirit guides. And so I kind of finished, I got some information from him, put it away. And maybe a year later, he popped through again. He said, we're going to write a book together. And he goes, you're supposed to ask me questions and I will answer them. And I'll shorten this a little bit. But while I'm writing the book, I said, your energy is so familiar to me. I said, you're my teacher on the craft, aren't you? And he said, finally, you figured it out. So he has been with me for lifetimes. And he's my teacher on that craft as part of the technological group. He's also part of that first responder group. We are writing books together. I'm uh, getting close to being finished with the next book because he said we're going to write three together. So the first first one we wrote together is Messages from Ramadir, A Collective Hope for Humanity. And I'm almost done with the second one now, but supposedly we're going to write three group, three books together. And the whole purpose is to take esoteric things and put it in a language modern humans can understand. And the way I try to explain it is, I mean, how many people read Shakespeare for fun? You know, not very many, but there are filmmakers right now, other writers who are taking Shakespeare and putting it in a language modern humans can understand. And people will say, I didn't know Shakespeare was funny. Oh, this is so interesting. Now I understand. 
And that's what Ramadir is doing with metaphysical, the paranormal, the extraterrestrial. And can I tell you, uh, he let me share one story while I was writing that first book. And I loved it because it really explains how to put something in a, a language modern humans can understand. And he said, life is very much like the childhood birthday game, pin the tail on the donkey. Like, well. <laughs> and he said, how much fun would it be if you showed up at a party and someone handed you a tail and said, see that donkey over there, go pin the tail on it. You didn't go, that was no fun. Big deal. What makes it fun is you're blindfolded, you're spun around. And how do you succeed? You listen to the party goers saying, oh, you're warm, you're warm. Oh, now you're cold. Oh, now you're hot. Life is very much like that. We know in spirit exactly who we are. We come down to this human form and it's like we've been blindfolded because we don't have the memory of what we're like in spirit. So it's like we're blindfolded and spun around. So how do we succeed with life? We listen to our spirit guides. We listen to our angels and they will tell us when we are hot, warm, or cold. That's the pin the tail on the donkey only in galactic terms. <laughs> Did they ever talk to you about reincarnation? That's something that's fascinating um, because we, well, the, the aspect of being reincarnated that, that I hate is we we come into this world as a, uh, like a new being. We, we, there's the filter that's, you know, the real us that we come to earth and we get sort of mind wiped and we start from scratch. So did they ever, yeah. Did they ever share anything regarding that? Yeah, they do. Um, in fact, I'm teaching a class on it called Living the Life Your Soul Intended. And it's it's hard to, to me, it's almost like two different subjects here. So I'm going to go with the first one. And the first time as a human being is not your first time on earth. We have been as animals, as plants, as other living beings before we can handle being human. And so typically there are about 10 soul ages, but there might be many, many lifetimes within each age. So when we see someone who is, we'll call it the fundamentals, the evangelicals that are very strict, very non-bending, those typically are newer human beings or younger souls because all souls were born at the same time. So there really is no such thing as an older soul, a younger soul. But what we call a young soul is they might not have had as many human incarnations. They've had incarnations on other planets. Um, space, you know, whatever. And so a young soul, I was equated to like a third grader. Would you expect a third grader to know calculus? No, you have to be patient and kind with them and teach them. So these people are new to being a human being and they don't necessarily have the social skills, the technical skills, anything like that. The older souls are the ones that you know, you could call them your parents. They are they're the ones teaching and guiding. But the whole thing is the evolution of the soul. So you can go from age one, two, three, up to age ten, which is experiencing everything that needs to be experienced as a human being. So that and we come down here again blindfolded, and we don't understand the gifts that we brought with us, the talents, the lessons we wanted to learn, the things we wanted to accomplish, the things we wanted to experience. So in this class that I teach, that's what we do is we go through and we claim all this, we clear the trauma and we claim the talents so you can live your best life, which is pretty cool. So now we bring that to reincarnation. And if there's no time on the other side, how can there be past lives? How can there be future lives? So it's, they're actually parallel lives. They're all happening at the same time. And it's really hard to wrap your head around this. So the way I like to, the, the way I learned to wrap my head around it, and hopefully your listeners can get a grasp on this too, pretend the ocean is source, God, creator. You take a bucket of that water. Is it still ocean water? Is it still source creator? Yeah, it's just a smaller version of it. Then you take a teaspoon of water out of that bucket. Is it still ocean water? Is it source creator? Yeah. Is it part of that bucket? Yeah. So if God source creator is the ocean, that bucket would be your soul. The teaspoons of water are your spirits or the different lives that you're leading. 
So it's all happening at the same time. And when one teaspoon or one life is finished, it goes back to the bucket. Another teaspoon finishes that life, it goes back to the bucket. So when all the teaspoons are done living their life, so to speak, they go back to the bucket. The bucket then goes back into the ocean, goes back to source from whence it came. Does that help kind of paint a picture of parallel lives? Because that's a tough one. Yeah. Have you ever had uh, like shadow beings in your bedroom? Every day. Really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how did they look like? Uh, mine were six feet tall, broad shouldered, uh, black, but I could see through them. And mm -hmm. where there would be a neck, I didn't see any neck, but I saw like a really big helmet. Oh. Like not okay. the top hat type of person that people talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, but how did yours look like? They look more uh, Sasquatchy. You know, that kind of a shape, only it would move and just kind of, I don't know, yeah, just kind of fluctuate in their movements a little bit. But I, I always felt very comforted. I always do feel comforted by them when I see them. And I got over being scared all the time because, you know, extraterrestrials are not really here to hurt us, or at least me. And so now when things pop in and I see things, they're welcome. I had this purple disc show up one night and it was huge. It was probably at least six, six and a half feet cross in my, in my bedroom. And it looked like just this big, huge swirl, but it was this beautiful purple color and just came whoosh, rushing into my bedroom. And I thought, this is so cool, but I'm really tired. So just go away. <laughs> now I wish I would have stayed awake and talked to it a little bit. Hey, wow. <laughs> Uh, I've never even had orbs in my bedroom. My dad, uh, uh, during the, the second event, when I called in the craft, uh, I got the feeling to get my folks. So I went inside the house and both came out at different intervals. But uh, my mom saw it a bit earlier. My dad saw it when it was, because it did a flyby. So he did see it further away. But uh, from that moment on, my dad had to start getting contact. Shadow beings, body taps. Uh, he wow. had a golden, four inch golden orb flying in the bedroom window uh one night and uh not too long ago we saw a um what appeared to him as a in his bedroom as a uh, a clown that looked a bit off weird ish they all look a little off and weird they try but they yeah. don't quite work <laughs> so that's uh that's amazing um coming back to downloads what happens uh because did you ever make heads or tails of what of the information that they shared with you it, it was a combination of things depending on the group that was contacting me. So the grays, the downloads were more like memories of being contacted and the examinations and, you know, that wall of jars filled with fetuses. It was all of that. The technological group, I keep getting what look like hieroglyphics. And so it, it could be math equations. I'm not sure what it is yet. And so evidently, <laughs> The time uh, maybe on a soul level i know what it is but on a human level i have no idea but i i see math equations and anybody who knows me knows i can't add two and two together math is not my strong suit <laughs> at all but on a soul level i, I ace it <laughs> okay. uh, regarding your contact uh, which you know ev eventually well did evolve over time but how do you see your contact for now do you see like more was it like a spiritual thing religious thing did it help you evolve? Very much it helped me evolve. There came a point with the grays where I said, no, I am done being examined. I've had too many physical things happen to me. And I said, I'm just done. And they showed me a contract and they said, no, you signed this. This is many, many lifetimes. And you've signed this, so you can't. And so I thought, well, okay, if I signed a contract, well, under hypnosis, my guides came and said, no, that's all smoke and mirrors, you have the right to break any contract. And so I did. I said, I rescind, I tear up any contract that I've had with extraterrestrial contact. And the grays then quit coming to me, but the technological group did too. And there was a level of me that felt lonely without it. So I called them back in again. I said, no, the technological group can stay because it feels like that's for the greater good. 
of not only humanity of planet Earth, but other planets. I was actually even told, I don't tell too many people this because, you know, there's only so much you can wrap your head around, that I serve on the Council of the Galactic Federation of Planets. And I had a download of that where I'm sitting at a conference table and there are hundreds of different species of extraterrestrials there. And it, the purpose is for for peace among the planets. And how do we get along with each other? How do we make this work galactically? And so it would be very much like two countries working together or two neighbors working together. How can we work together? How can we get along and be friendly? And that's what this Federation of Planets is. So with the technological group, very much for the greater good of the galactic beings and not just on planet earth the part of me being a psychic medium that feels like that's planet earth it's helped to raise the vibration of the planet to save us from ourselves <laughs> because we are destroying our own planet and i among millions of other people have volunteered to be here to help raise the vibration of the planet so we don't destroy it coming back to your book um now was there a specific, did they tell you that you had to write a book or was it for yourself to, to help you heal, to get your story out? The first one, We Are Not Alone, My Extraterrestrial Contact, that was my choice. It was the hardest decision I ever had to make because I was so worried about judgment being made to look ridiculous and judgment from my family. And finally, I said, you know what? I'm not writing this for my family. I'm writing it for people who have nowhere to go and no one to talk to. And when I, that finally reconciled in my head, the book ran out, came out of my fingertips and just almost wrote itself. And it was three days after it was published, I was contacted by a filmmaker. And then we started the documentary to get that rolling. COVID interrupted it for a few years, but it finally got made and premiered. The other book, Ramadir, Messages from Ramadir, that kit started with automatic writing. And he said he just needed a commitment from me that I would actually do this. He says, if you don't want to do it, we'll move on to somebody else. And I said, I'll do it. And so I started asking questions and started dictating his answers. And he said, this is so slow and so cumbersome for you to handwrite or type these. He goes, so when the book is finished, you're going to start trans-channeling. And I'm like, what? <laughs> okay. And the day I got the book in my hands, before I'd even announced it publicly, he popped through in a psychic medium session with someone. And so for the past year, year and a half now, um, I hold public events where I trans channel Ramadir, who's the extraterrestrial, my teacher on the craft. And so other people can ask questions and he will answer them. And actually, April 19th is the first online Ramadir session. So I'm going to do that over Zoom. Wow. So, I, yeah, I had a year and a half to practice in person and now it's going to be over Zoom. So, you know, our entire planet can log in if they want to and experience it and ask questions of him. One thing that continues to happen to me are light bulbs blowing out when I walk through rooms. And I used to have migraine headaches. And when that would start to dissipate, I'd walk into the kitchen to get a glass of water or something. And light bulbs would blow, 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 blow. But And a lot of people say that happens. But the light bulb doesn't go out. The light bulb explodes. And it's every place I've ever lived. I will walk in. And sometimes the light doesn't even have to be on. I'll walk into a dark room and whoosh, the light bulbs explode and shatter and go all over the room. That, like I said, it's happened everywhere I've ever lived. So it's not an older home with bad wiring. It's everywhere. And that continues to happen to this day. So what happens with technology like uh, batteries, uh, wristwatches, do they die off too? I <laughs> I can't wear wristwatches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that kind of technology, I can't have it on my body. It just doesn't work. Okay. We're close to the end of the show. Uh, do you have a uh, uh, maybe a closing statement or a final, uh, a last story that you might want to share with everyone? Hollywood, our government, wants to keep us in a state of fear. And now with all the smartphones available, people are getting pictures they're getting proof that extraterrestrials exist 
And so our government now has to admit that they do exist, but they're adding the element of fear that we're under attack. And we another reason for us to be scared. And I'm telling you, we are not under attack. The extraterrestrials are spirit guides of our planet. They are here to save us from ourselves and to protect us. And please, please, please do not be afraid of what you hear from governments, politicians, other powers that be, because it's not true. So it's been fun, Christy, to have you on today. Thank you so much. And I love your positive message of ET contact. So thank, thank you, you so, so much. much for doing your podcast and getting the message out there to the world. It's badly needed. Yeah. So to those watching, hope you enjoyed today's interview. I'm your host, Mr. Gray. More interviews coming up and I'll see you guys next time. So take care, everyone. Hello, everyone. This is Mr. Gray. And thanks for watching today's episode. If you are an abductee, contactee, or experiencer, and you believe that your story could help others, please feel free to contact me through my YouTube channel email. When it comes to experiencers, the ET phenomena, and the future, remember, truth will out.